Uh, joining us in the studio is Christopher Lokia, the Secretary General of Doctors Without Borders, to discuss MSF's uh, work on the front lines of crisis. Now, Mr. Lokia, welcome to the studio. Now, firstly, conflict zones like Gaza, Sudan and Myanmar pose extreme risks uh, with volatile environments, targeted attacks and limited access to essential resources. How does MSF navigate such dangerous areas and more importantly, to ensure the safety of its teams on the ground? Mm. Well, Paul, it's a really pertinent um, question. Just in the last year, we ourselves have had something like 84 reported security incidents in Sudan, whether that's um, due to attacks on our teams, uh, medical infrastructure or vehicles. And over the last year in Gaza, we've had uh, eight of our staff tragically killed. There's no magic solution to how you keep your teams uh, safe, and often it's, uh, it would be a stretch to say that, that we are. But we do it via negotiating with the, the warring parties, talking about what we want to, to, to do, telling them that where we're going to be, and ultimately trying to provide quality medical services in the areas that it's most needed, so we're accepted by the community. Now, a number of MSF staff have been killed in the conflict in Gaza and Sudan recently. Uh, has there been any accountability mm. for their deaths and what must be done to prevent more casualties in such situations? Very, very little. We've asked for, and we continue to ask for accountability of the deaths of our staff. We do our own investigation and follow-up, but we also um, want those who are responsible, um, the perpetrators of these crimes, to be held accountable as well. Um, this is at both the local level, but it's also a sign of diminishing respect for international humanitarian law, the laws of war. Uh, medical personnel, humanitarian workers are protected under that, that law. Unless, and unless globally we hold each other to account for adhering to that law, we are ri at risk of seeing a further deterioration in the safety of aid workers. Now, adding to that, uh, in most uh, conflict areas, MSF works closely with local health providers. How does this collaboration keep healthcare going, knowing that MSF's direct access is also limited? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a really important observation. In the vast majority of places that we work, we try and work alongside local ministries of, of, of health. We like to um, support those ministries of health and, and those local health workers where we, where we can. We partner with them. But in somewhere like uh, Gaza, the health infrastructure has been uh, decimated. There's now something like uh, 19 of the 36 hospitals in Gaza have been destroyed through to a, due to a systematic destruction of the healthcare system. So it becomes extremely difficult to continue to partner in a situation where our colleagues are essentially being targeted. Now, you have been unequivocal in your support for UNRWA. What do you make of Israel's allegation that Hamas has infiltrated the organization and now has banned uh, the aid agency? I think UNRWA really is the backbone of the humanitarian response in, in Gaza. Um, you see floods of statements from UN agencies and uh, non-governmental organizations, humanitarian organizations, over the last 24 hours. And all of them are saying that UNRWA is a lifeline for the people of Palestine. We, as an as a independent, large medical humanitarian organization, are also unequivocal in that we, re we need them for our access in Gaza as, as well. Now, in Gaza and uh, Sudan, the erosion of international humanitarian law is an alarming trend. What steps is MSF taking to highlight and challenge these violations? Well, we're going to continue talking about these violations. We're going to keep talking about states' responsibility because it is ultimately their responsibility to uphold international humanitarian law. It's something that they have committed to. And we're going to continue to push them to do their job when it comes to ensuring that they do, uh, uh, they do hold violations of international humanitarian law to account and they continue to promote it as a means to allow there to be some form of order when it comes to these horrific conflicts. Now, from your perspective, how uh, can Asian countries play a role in upholding humanitarian standards and uh, specifically taking violators accountable to these uh, high conflict areas? Well, it, it, Asia, as well as anywhere else in the world, has a responsibility to ensure um, that international humanitarian law is, is, is upheld. In the same way to, um, uh, to, to what I've just been describing, to continue to talk about it, to continue to use the platforms at uh, your disposal, whether that be uh, the ASEAN, whether that be the United Nations, and ensuring that IHL, its promotion and its defence remains at the top of the agenda. Now, talk about health concerns uh, often get sidelined in climate policy discussion despite clear links between climate change and health crisis. As these climate impacts grow, uh, what steps is MSF taking to make sure that health remains a priority in uh, global climate discussions? 
Well, you're right. The climate crisis is a, is a health um, crisis. And we are promoting that all discussions around climate change have a health element into it. I don't think that's happening uh, enough, but I think that also needs to be based on increasing research around the impacts of climate change on, on health. If you look at uh, the uh, development and the progress of dengue fever around the, the world, something that's endemic in, in, in Asia, um, that has uh, taken off with climate, climate change and the number of people who are exposed to dengue fever is increasing rapidly um, at the moment and is a massive concern. There's a lot of work happening in, in Asia in terms of methods of preventing mosquitoes from transmitting dengue fever. And that's something that can really be transmitted to other parts of the, the world and something that we would like to do. Now, lastly, uh, conflict and climate ch challenges certainly escalating, as we can see. How is MSF preparing to navigate the many uh, this volatile and unpredictable humanitarian landscape? Well, I think there's, there's, there's several answers to, um, to that. Firstly, um, we must remain responsive. We must be able to have surveillance around the world to ensure that we, we know when things are, are happening. But also it goes back to uh, sort of your first question in many ways. One of the, the difficulties that we have in, in all of these conflicts, whether it's being Gaza or Sudan or Myanmar, for example, is access to the people who are most affected that we're struggling with most. So often um, the difficulty is with the authorities, with the negotiations, of the belligerents, of the warring parties, to be able to get to the people who need it the most. And whatever the crisis, whether it's a cyclone, a typhoon, an earthquake, or uh, a violent conflict, a man-made conflict, it's getting that access which is key to be able to treat people who are suffering and provide them with their most essential basic needs. All right, Mr. Lockyer, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insights with us. And we've been speaking to Christopher Lockyer, the MSF International Secretary General. Thank you.